que mucho de la contaminación y algunas cosas han cambiado, pero todavía, por ejemplo, se esperaba que para el 96 ya se mire algo tan diferente y eso definitivamente no ha ocurrido porque estamos todavía mirando muchísima contaminación en el agua. Um, so maybe you can refer, Sean, thanks for this historical context, um, but how does your organization work directly um, making efforts to get towards the our our goal of having clean water yeah so so the clean water act really was one of the first tools that groups like soundkeeper started leveraging when we were created so we were founded almost 40 years ago um in a model uh, a lot like some other keeper organ water keeper organizations around the country It started 60 years ago on the Hudson River, people really using the law to protect their waterways uh, through lawsuits, through administrative action. So going in front of state departments of ecology, for example, and, and, and pushing for changes in the rules and the regulations. And so that's what we do here. That's, that's really the bread and butter core aspect of our work is, is that enforcing the Clean Water Act, using its tools, leveraging our um, advocates in Olympia to work with state agencies and with the federal government to make sure that all the, the, the permits that we have in place are the most protective and innovative, to make sure that they're being enforced, to make sure that they're being developed with communities and working uh, all together at the same time. That's wonderful. Thanks for all your work and for doing um, the things to, for us to be protected in our communities, but also our habitat. Um, una de las cosas que estaba diciendo Sean que hacen en su organización es uh, hace mucho tiempo cuando empezaron con el río Hudson que queda en Nueva York es um, hacer eh, procedimientos legales que puedan hacer ellos contribuir para que pueda la comunidad pues tener beneficios de la, de la limpieza. Entonces ellos se dedican a eso la mayoría del tiempo ahora a la regulación si es que alguna de las empresas no está eh, cumpliendo con las reglas que deberían. Pues ahí está el Budget Sound Keeper um, haciendo lo que deberían hacer asegurando la regulación. Um, Sean, one follow up question that I have is um, How, how do you do the patrolling and how does that link to your mission? And what do you look for when you go out? Because it's such a good um, thing to do to be out on the waters. Where do you patrol? How often? And just one second. Luis, estoy escuchando un eco otra vez. Si por favor podría bajar el volumen de la cabina. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, so I think that it's you know, taking a step back, while we do talk a lot about the law at Soundkeeper, we're not just working on, you know, in, in courtrooms. In fact, we're rarely in a courtroom. A lot of it is is out in the communities. Um, and so we uh, patrol on the waterfronts. We have kayak patrols. We have a, a vessel that we use to go around the Sound up the Duwamish River uh, on our waterfronts. We kayak along our coasts. We do walking patrols and bike patrols. And what I mean by patrol is we're out there looking for problems that can be solved. Uh, sometimes those problems are, um, you know, an industrial facility that's got water gushing out of a place that water shouldn't be gushing out of, or it's a pipe that's coming out of the ground leaking oil and nobody knows why it's doing that. Um, those are some of the things that we spot. We also spot, um, you know, uh, you know, oil slicks on waterways. We clean up garbage as we're going around. We educate communities. Uh, and, and youth groups from schools uh, about what clean water and how watersheds function while we're doing this. We're also looking at facilities and checking with, uh, you know, running what we see on the ground on our patrols by what they're supposed to be doing under the law and making sure those two things line up so that we're constantly on the look for, for places where we need to, we can either make a phone call and have somebody fix a problem or we can bring a lawsuit if, if it's an egregious problem that needs that level of action, uh, or we can make a, um, you know, a new friend and go in and connect with some of these businesses that might not know their obligations and develop that kind of commonality of purpose. So, estamos hablando que es, es muy bueno esto de poder tener las patrullas del agua porque puedes ahí salir con la comunidad y también invitar a las personas de su estado a mirar qué está pasando en el 
en el agua, mirar si es que, por ejemplo, tienen algunos líquidos que están viniendo de las industrias, ellos lo pueden reportar y pueda tomar acción si es que alguien está actuando um, que en algo que no está beneficiando a la comunidad y obviamente el agua. Y por eso es muy importante estar ahí eh, supervisando y poder ver que quiénes son buenos amigos y quiénes son no de, de el medio ambiente del agua y poderlos traer a, a que rindan, rindan cuentas, pues. Um, so, I, did you cover a little bit more on like what has happened? Could you, without giving too much details on who, but maybe mention a successful after your actions that you have done and what we have been able to accomplish? And maybe we can narrow it down to on around the Duwamish. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we like to, um, celebrate as many victories as we can, of course, to show that the system is working. Um, but we also don't like to harp on those victories because we don't really want to, um, you know, uh, grind somebody into the ground when they're doing something better. Um, most of the groups that we bring lawsuits against, uh, in my experience uh, here and, and, and in other watersheds, don't necessarily know the full extent of what they need to be doing sometimes and are willing uh, to work with us to try to find those solutions. So there's a lot of great, you know, community stewards and companies that that want to protect their local environment and the communities around them. Um, sometimes they need a, a letter from some lawyers to get that to happen. Sometimes they uh, they don't. But, you know, one really great example is is we 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 brought a Clean Water Act lawsuit against a company on the Duwamish for a bunch of stormwater violations, uh, things running off into the Duwamish River, not you know making sure to to, to cover and capture a lot of their their uh, pollution sources, just doing a whole host of things wrong. And as part of that, we were able to direct um, you know a significant amount of money to some restoration projects for salmon restoration up in the Green River. Uh, helping state agencies finish construction of uh, of a site that's bringing back uh, 20 to 40 acres, depending on where the, the the river is in flood stage, of salmon habitat for juveniles. Uh, and so that's that's a project that wouldn't have happened without the funds generated through our enforcement actions, which is important to note. We don't get any money from these enforcement actions. We we are not allowed to under the Clean Water Act. If under the Clean Water Act, if the EPA or the state goes after somebody with an enforcement, you're violating a state law, the state can go after you, that money goes to the state. When we enforce it, that money does not go to us. Uh, but we can redirect that money through settlements to projects in the community to help restore the rivers that were harmed by that pollution. Es tan importante lo que dice que, por ejemplo, después de un procedimiento legal, si es, eh, se prueba y se comprueba todo lo que hacen, la organización redistribuye esos fondos a la comunidad para proyectos comunitarios. Por ejemplo, le pregunté si algo en el Duwamish que es más tangible y pues después de que encontraron violaciones en tal empresa, eh, violaciones de que no estaban haciendo bien el conducto y la, la contaminación, eh, se siguió el procedimiento legal y esos fondos um, de de, de, de la, del procedimiento fueron a beneficiar a la comunidad para proyectos que pueden hacer con jóvenes o para restauración, por ejemplo, del salmón y que es tan importante para poder nosotros mejorar el medio ambiente. Um, well, I'm very uh, grateful to all, all the things that you do to protect the water and to definitely to be our eyes um, on the water when, when you are acting, uh, bringing those patrols. What what was and, and this is a very a little bit of a tricky question, but when you came to Seattle because you moved from the East Coast, what was something that was an eye opening for you saying, "Wow, I really need to work in this"? Like what what has been disheartening to see that still some violations are happening on the water or on the Duwamish um, that has made your work even more meaningful because you have quite a so, a lot of experience in doing this work, but were you surprised to see what you saw around the Duwamish or like anything that you would like to share about that? Yeah, that's that's not a tricky question. It's a it's a pretty simple one. And 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 one of from the start, I think one of the things that struck me the most about the Duwamish was that, you know, for the community to get out onto that river, which is always described as Seattle's only river, the community has to, you know, 
push aside piles of debris, climb through a fence, get over, you know, like uh, metaphorically or literally speaking, has so much difficulty accessing this only river in Seattle uh, and thoroughly enjoying it as a community resource. M you know, moreover, what's going on there is negatively impacting the communities around it. So there's, um, you know, there's so much work to be done to make it a, a place where everybody can coexist. And it's possible. It's done all over the country. Um, you know, street end access points, uh, you know, really nice green infrastructure around the place to help air quality. Um, you know, there's uh, better lighting, better street maintenance, you know, public services, bus stops, community schools, um, you know, uh, water landings and places for kayaks to hop in. And all of that, you know, tribes have difficulty accessing, you know, the communities have difficulty accessing. And getting to waters is the first step in turning people's minds around on how that's a, a resource. If you can't see the water, whether you're the mayor, the governor, or somebody working in one of the facilities along it, if you're not looking at the water, you don't value the water. So we need to have people to be able to get to, see, and enjoy the water before we can start to turn around a lot of the work uh, needed uh, and accelerate that towards that you know vibrant community resource that we know it, it should be and it can be. Now that you mentioned the vibrant communities, it is important that we also let community know that your amazing work and supporting other things, not just water related, um, which, you know, this community having cumulative impacts of many different sources of environmental injustices. You've been having a great um, support or you've been giving a great support and 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 help to these communities about the air. Um, and everything to us relate right like when you live in an environmental justice community how the water relates and what's happening and also bring the other injustices but would you like to talk a little bit more about that as well those intersections yeah that, that's i mean that's a great point and it's a lot of what we do is work on water that's you know i got the background here with water on it and and things it's it's very much um tied to air though it's all one and the same starting from the largest level with climate change. Climate change is an air atmosphere driven, um, horrendous man-made problem affecting every facet of life, including waterways. So you can't work on saving watersheds without working on having clean air around them. Uh, and you can't work on supporting communities without working on air either. It's definitely all interconnected. And in places like the Duwamish, there's a host of air issues that you know, range from pollution from airports you know, lead in aviation gasoline from, you know, prop planes flying in and out of air, local airports, all the way down to, you know, uh, particles of metal dust flying off of industrial sites. There's odors, there's, there's all sorts of airborne uh, toxins that come out of some of these facilities. And those, yes, they land on the water. And so we're concerned about the fish in their ingest ingesting of those as well, but we're, we're predominantly concerned about the communities there. But the good news is, is a lot of the same tools help a lot of those things. More trees, more open space, more pollinator habitat, better transparency and enforcement at industrial sites, innovation than in how to coexist. So there's tons and tons and tons of solutions uh, that can help fix the water, the air, the access to our waterfronts and open spaces and help communities thrive. Estamos hablando un poquito de cómo hace la intersección del agua y del aire, todos los trabajos que hacen, porque si está el aire contaminado, obviamente que va a traer al agua también esa contaminación y cómo podemos nosotros apoyar a la comunidad y trabajando juntos en algo que es tan importante de la justicia ambiental, ¿no? Porque lo que hacemos, el impacto y siempre perpetúa en toda la salud de la comunidad que vive alrededor. Entonces, es importante que nosotros podamos uh, trabajar en esos dos componentes que han, han estado ya um, impactando tanto a la comunidad por tantos años, nuestra comunidad del Duwamish, y que tenemos el derecho de tener nosotros una mejor salud. Um, Sean, and... Um, and also, uh, uh, go ahead. just following up on that, I mean, it's, it's not just important that we work together. It's, it's, I think it's vital that we always talk about the things together. Every time we have a conversation with an industrial site, again, and most of them want to fix things and be better neighbors, right? In my experience, um, you know, when we have conversations with them about water, 
we we don't just stop there. We bring in the air because even though it may not be something related to the lawsuit that brought us to the table meeting with them, it's something that they may not know about. And so it's it's very important that we communicate as a community about all these issues so that anytime any single one of us is in a meeting about an air issue, you bring up water, water, you bring up air. If you're talking about garbage and sanitation services, you talk about green infrastructure. And that leads to the point that, you know, we really need um, everybody to be aware of our our collective community vision for the Duwamish and where it's going so that everyone knows what they can do to help make that success. Thank you. That's a very important point. And as you are referring to the collective, um, I also wanted to ask you, where do you think we are at with the government being along into this journey and also being part of the collective? Um, do you feel like we're in a good state um, to be able to accomplish our goals or what is happening that we haven't been able to move to the speed of what the community would like us to move? Yeah, I think, you know, I spent a couple of years working for the federal government and um, and then I've spent many, many more years than that suing the federal government <laughs> and working with them on solutions, innovations and projects and new approaches to things. And and I'll start by saying, you know, I think the world of our public servants and they they get up and go to work every day hoping that they can figure out an innovative solution that that helps everybody get better. Um, that's that's by and large been my experience with everybody from municipalities, from towns, all the way up to the federal government. Um, and the problem, one of the problems is to that is the speed of change. You know, it takes it could take a year to hire somebody into the into a state or a county government position or federal government a year. Um, a lot of times you have um, an inability baked into our federal systems in our state systems where you can't have people learn on the job from somebody um, while that person's retiring because then that's two people doing one job and that's not allowed and so the systems we have put in place at the federal and the state levels oftentimes preclude us from moving fast towards innovation but it's not that there's not the the interest or the desire the hope there at those levels and so you know i'm very interested in working with um, federal state agencies to figure out all those innovative ways that we can work faster together because I know they want to hire 10 more people to work on the Duwamish River. I know they want to hire 100 more people to work on the Duwamish River and finish the signs quicker. Um, they just need help getting there and that's that's another aspect of our work that we do with you and we do with others is, is talking to our elected officials and saying they need more money but you can't just throw a hundred million dollars at an agency without hiring an extra 10 people to manage that $100 million. Because the 10 people that are working on the Duwamish right now are already working full-time jobs on it. So if you give them a lot more to do, they're going to do uh, a lot more because they're willing to and they're awesome people, but it's going to spread them thinner. And what we need is we need 10 more people to help with that $100 million. So you kind of have to you have to be all in on having a government partner there to run our science, our management, to mediate our conversations between parties. It's 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 super important partner in, in all things progress. Sí, uh, he preguntado a, a Sean que si estamos ahorita en, en un buen momento en el gobierno porque las cosas a veces se mueven lento y es, es un poco difícil poder lidiar con todo eso, pero lo que queremos es que entender que las personas que trabajan, obviamente tenemos mucho respeto por ellos. Um, pero también a veces la parte burocrática cambia porque tienen que pasar varios procesos y no, no nos movemos a, a la velocidad que quisiéramos para poder afrontar las cosas que tenemos. Pero pues es importante que podemos reconocer que a veces ah, como comunidad tenemos que tener la paciencia, pero también mantener nuestro gobierno eh, en, los, eh, en nuestros pensamientos de, ok, ya dijiste que ibas a hacer esto, cuánto tiempo va a durar y cuánto tiempo vamos a demorarnos para poder que ellos puedan rendir cuentas de una manera saludable para y también a tiempo para que nuestra comunidad no siga afectada. Entonces, el trabajo que no ha hecho. Well, time is flying with well, you, flying and we with have a few, few minutes left, Sean. Minutes left, and Sean. I wanted yes. just to wanted just to, to ask you about you. Like, how, did you about you? Interested like, how did you get interested in this work? 
with your background. I know that you've traveled in South America. Tell us a little bit more about you. Oh yeah, no, I'm 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 just me. I'm Sean. Um, I think I've always had an interest in fish and waterways um, since I was. Uh, a young kid working on um, looking into becoming a marine biologist until until well I still want to be a marine biologist every day of the week uh, and so I studied marine biology in, in, in middle school and high school and college uh, master's degree in that and so I've, I've always kind of loved our coastal and marine ecosystems um, I worked in Alaska as a fisheries observer for a year and and got hooked on the concept of using the law to make changes and so that's when I I went to law school to focus on on environmental law, and I've been working in it uh, ever since. Um, I've worked for three nonprofits in the federal government, all working in the public interest sector. Um, but I've always, I've I've regularly come back to Seattle over the years. My my mom um, worked as a as a ship fitter and a ship scaler in the shipyards on the Duwamish River out on Harbor Island for uh, most of the 70s, um, joining as a laborer and becoming a shop steward, learning how to weld. Um, and then eventually becoming an electrician, working in shipyards in other parts of the country as well after this. And so we've, we've always had um, Seattle in our hearts and the Duwamish River. And so um, the opportunity to come back here was, was, was super exciting and I couldn't wait. Así es que pues estamos escuchando un poco más de, de Sean, su vida, cómo le interesó eh, al principio de ser un marino biólogo y ahora hasta ahora quiere seguir haciendo eso, aunque tiene su ahora su licencia de abogacía, pues eso le hace también ser importante en, en su organización por los roles que cumple la organización Puget Sound Keeper. Y pues ahora vamos a poder seguir trabajando como coalición para poder uh, desarrollar más cosas juntos. One thing that I One forgot to mention, forgot is, to mention is Puget Sound Keeper, Keeper is part of a bigger keeper organization. Keeper organization. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little hard to understand. Could, you, hard refer to understand. To Could you refer to that, a, to that? a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, thank you for, for also for having me. And, and thank you for not asking me to speak in Spanish. I understood almost everything you're saying because, um, I, as you know, I lived in Ecuador for, uh, for eight months and, and studied in that beautiful country. Um, studied marine biology and ecology down there, but um, uh, thank you for not making me try to butcher terms of art <laughs> as well. You know them much better than I do. Yeah, Puget Sound Keeper is part of the Waterkeeper Alliance. Uh, we're actually one of the six founding organizations of that alliance. So in 1990, there were six groups that had the keeper word in them around the country. Um, Hudson River Keeper, uh, San Francisco Bay Keeper, Puget Sound Keeper, and a couple others. Um, and we came together and founded the Waterkeeper Alliance to drive this local watershed activism using the law and working with communities around the world. And so now we have 180 waterkeeper organizations in the United States and over 350 around the world. Um, it's a huge, it's a wonderful network of activists. Every single organization maintains that same approach of being on the water ready to step into court to protect it and working with the communities to talk about about how to solve its problems and so that's the kind of trifecta being out on the water working with communities and ready to take action where needed but at that local level where you're never going to meet a water keeper um, that works nationally or just you know sits in dc and has an, has an office there and is working directly with congress because we are we are in waterways the ones that are in dc are the anacostia river keeper and the potomac river keeper and the ones that are working on dc's local waterways so it's it's a it's a wonderful network of local community activists um, all around the world and i love being part of it Thank you, Sean. And we Thank love you, that Puget Sound Keeper is part of our coalition. Of our coalition. Um, you do very important work, very and important we feel um, also um, part of this collective that is working towards uh, clean water. And clean it, water it's and wonderful to be in company for all your, the work that you do. Is there anything um, there that you would anything, like to um, encourage like people to, encourage to people volunteer, to come to your kayak tours, to to see what it is to be? A Puget Sound um, keeper, Puget person. <laughs> keeper person. Yeah, well, we're we're always looking for new volunteers. We we do cleanups and kayak patrols uh, all summer long, all year long, actually. Um, we're going to be doing our our annual 
uh, 5th of July cleanup of Lake Union after the fireworks show. But in large part, you know, I'd ask anybody listening or interested in helping to, to find your local organization, go to DRCC and figure out, you know, who's doing the work in your neighborhoods. Because by and large, we need more people that are walking around their neighborhoods, collaborating with their neighbors, whether it's a business or a government entity doing work nearby, you know, figure out who's digging up that sewer system and talk to them about why they chose your neighborhood and how they can work together. So we need more hands on deck everywhere across our community, not just with Soundkeeper. But of course, come out and join us. We'd love to see you on the water. Así que pues una, una invitación para las personas que nos están escuchando um, que podemos nosotros unir manos y traer, ya saben, a través del DRCC o a través de Puget Soundkeeper, lo más importante es estar en el agua y todos podemos ser, es, hacer abogacía por, por, nuestra, por nuestras aguas locales, que es lo más importante, ya sean a través del kayak tour, ya sean a través del bote, um, también se puede ir con, con Sean a veces a estar de policía del agua y es muy importante el trabajo, aprender un poco más eh, y, y poder ser parte de, de este eh, colaborativo que queremos hacer para que nuestra comunidad pueda estar saludable y, y proteger nuestra agua. Sean, thank you so much for being with us and I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm still hearing my echo and it makes it a little hard, but you were great. And um, I want to thank everyone for listening, and I hope um, you have a nice rest of the day. Thanks for having me. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Care.